Yes. Okay, let's go. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just check on Facebook to make sure we are actually live because something is happening here. Yes, we are. Ha <laughs> ha. Very good. As I say, very informal. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our elephant professional lecture. Um, the first one after a while, which is why we're a little bit relaxed. As you can see, I'm sitting outside in the uh, in the Anantara Golden Triangle here, our sponsors, and um, generally enjoying life. A glass of water. Apologies to everybody who was expecting a lockdown live stream this afternoon. Um, it didn't come off because I was in another meeting, but luckily we've been able to get, um, we've been able to go ahead with the elephant professional. My meeting finished in time. Um, and we have Dr. Nurse Farina Osman, who is um, an expert in uh, the conservation of Bornean elephants. And she's actually currently in the field in Kinabantang and is going to try and get through with poor internet and talk about it and <laughs> talk about all she has done and all her team have done to uh, to preserve the elephants there. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over and uh, we will try and go before her before her internet drops out. Um, oh, hi, Antoinette. Antoinette <laughs> arrived as well. <laughs> okay. Hello. Okay. Over to you, yep. Dr. Farina. Thanks, John. Thank you so much. Um... Thank you very much, John, for having me. And I'm so sorry when I promised John that I'm going to give a talk today. I thought that I will be in the town, but actually then things change. You know, the life of conservation is never the same. You have to go with the flow. So here I am in Kinabatangan. Actually, I wish that I could show you the uh, river behind me, but it's it's the internet there is not too good. So I will stick in, in our uh, field station here. Um, so today I would just like to um, share with you a little bit, like John said, uh, please pardon me if you can hear any sound uh, behind me. Uh, so I'm going to share with everyone, uh, you know, the work that we are doing in one of the most uh, diverse region in Sabah. Um, Kinabatangan. Uh, John, if you could help me to go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, I cannot share my screen, so John is going to help me with that. John? Uh, yes, oh, yeah. I have I have your second screen here, so. Okay, cool. It's a little bit slow for me here, so. I, I will stop my video now just in case, you know, let, after I finish my talk, then I will tune, uh, switch on again my, my camera just in case it will help the, the network. So here we go. The Sukina so Batangan is uh, the longest uh, river in Sabah, 560 kilometer. Uh, it's the, I've been here since 2008. Uh, 6, 2007, the first time I came to this, um, to this area, uh, you know, Don, if you can go to the next slide, please. All right, so uh, it's the home to so many species, um, you know, you have all the eight species of hornbills, um, obviously it's the home to the burden elephants, it's the best uh, place to observe the orangutan and also the proboscis monkey uh, and, and I love the most is when during the sunset so when you spend the whole day under the sun following the elephants and when you come back uh, to to the village uh, you know the sunsets the wind that really you know push uh, your face it's really relaxing and you know it's like um, I forget all all my problems so you know, so this is Kinabatangan where, where we work. Next slide, please, John. Um, but obviously, you know, with um, this flat, uh, flat plane is very, uh, you know, suitable not only for, for the animals, but that is also very suitable for, um, you know, planting oil palm, for example. So since uh, the beginning in, in 1980s, when uh, we have already um, locked all the timbers here, then we started to uh, convert 
this area to open plantation uh, for our social economic development, right? So most of uh, like the other uh, places, uh, there is a lot of pressure, you know, like fermentation and we still have uh, habitat loss. So actually, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please, uh, John. So if you look at this map, so we are actually uh, on the north uh, part of the Borneo, uh, the Borneo uh, island. And uh, Lower Kiamana Batanga is in the east coast. As you can see in the darker, uh, in the gray area here, these are uh, the forest reserve and the green color is all the wildlife sanctuary which is actually a corridor trying to connect all these forest reserves. So you, you, as you can, uh, and then all the white color there, those are all plant, uh, all palm plantation. So you can see that this uh, landscape is being surrounded uh, with all palm plantations and other, other development. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so although we have all this, you know, pressure, uh, in on, on the habitats, as I said, you know, you can you can still see a lot of um, species that uh, really it's very hard to observe them when you are in other, uh, you know, forests. So we have different types of primates here. Next one, please. Um, you have the slow lorries, you have the tarsier, um, silver langer. Um, pigtail, macaque, um, obviously orangutan. Um, Hello, Farina. Oh dear, ladies and gentlemen, we've lost Farina for a second, it seems. Or can can others hear her? Ah. <laughs> I am back. Oh, welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, all right. So, I will I will I will not stop from uh, apologizing to everyone for this hiccup. So, please bear with me. Uh, and then we also have, you know, um, different uh, carnivores. We have the uh, sun bear and uh, all of these pictures are taken from our uh, camera traps. Um, clouded leopard, uh, leopard cat, these are all very secretive uh, species, uh, but it's so wonderful to see how they are surviving in this uh, human dominated landscape. So that's why it's very, very uh, crucial for us to keep fighting to protect uh, Lower Kinabatangan. All right, next one, please. All right, so I want to focus on this um, one of the iconic species of Sabah, uh, the Burden elephants. A lot of people here comes uh, to visit uh, this region just to watch them. Um, I think some of you and I can see my friend here and uh, who has been here. Uh, it's very wonderful to see when the elephants come out to the riverbank and start to feed and, and swim. So it's, it's the best uh, place to actually observe um, uh, burden elephants. Next one, please. All right, so a lot one, uh, I, I receive a lot of uh, question from people saying that uh, really uh, does, uh, you know, burden elephant is, is really small, you know, like a pig because they keep calling it as uh, burden pygmy elephants. So for me, uh, I mean, morphologically, they are they look the same, but obviously they you know because of the island effect, they might look um a little bit rounded their body, uh, and this is Chandra actually the one that have less pigmentation, so that will be on your right I think, um so Chandra is uh the one of uh, the only burden elephants that live in North America in Oregon Zoo. She was brought there because uh, she was found often and, and injured. So I guess, um, uh, and then Oregon Zoo uh, kind of took her and, and looked after her. So I, and then uh, the other elephants, I think, was uh, born uh, to a Thai 
uh, she was born in, in, in captivity, but born to uh, uh, elephants from Thailand. So as you can see, there is not much differences except for Chandra have more, um, you know, like more hairy. Uh, so our male can still reach to, you know, three, three meters uh, high. So to be honest, um, physically they are not that that small. Uh, but the 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 unique thing about Bornean elephants is that they are genetically different from other Asian elephants population. So they uh, has been recognized by the Asian elephant specialist group as the one of the subspecies of Asian elephants. Uh, next one, please. Uh, I think there are a lot of hypotheses. Uh, you know how these elephants arrive in Borneo, for example. So um, there are a lot of documentation uh, saying that, you know, probability that this, the elephants were brought from Java to Sulu and from Sulu to Sabah. Uh, next one, please. Uh, but from like genetic um, uh, analysis, so uh, I was, I did this during my, my master's. Uh, this is one of the biggest poop I ever seen <laughs> during my whole career. I never seen one of uh, you know anything big like this after that. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they they don't they they cannot believe when I said that you can get actually DNA samples from from elephant dung, uh, especially when it's very fresh like this. You will collect um uh the part that yeah, that is still um. Uh, intact and the outer layer of the dung so you will get uh, um, DNA sample DNA from there uh, next one please so we did the the analysis and we find out that um, so that that study was done in 2000 and around 2006 uh, and then uh, another colleague uh, also did this uh, the same uh, genetic analysis as well previous uh, before us. And when we compare both of this study, uh, although they, they, uh, they, they disagree that uh, the period when the elephants came to, to Borneo, but both of the studies agree that it should be given uh, as a suspicious uh, status. So there is no more uh, argument saying that uh, you know our elephants are not uh, endemic in, in Borneo so right now we can conclude that uh, our elephants Borneo elephant is a subspecies of Asian elephants all right next one look please uh, okay so I am pretty lucky because uh, I, I get the opportunity to follow the elephants group in Kinabatangan uh, you know, really try to understand their behavior and their movement strategy in this area. I get to identify uh, females. Um, next one, please. Uh, for my PhD. Um, and another, you know, questions that I always get from people is that, do you have your favorite elephant? So obviously, uh, <laughs> I, I, I tend to answer you know, every elephant is very special. Uh, the, each of these elephants have their own personality. But I think if I have to pick one of all 200 elephants we here have here, I would think that maybe Tess and Bell would be uh, my, my kind of my, my favorite. Uh, so they are actually, I'm not sure if they are sisters or if they are, you know, um, but their body size is more or less the same. Uh, and then we estimated their age to be like more or less. So I think they are sisters uh, and they really help each other. So there was one time we tried to call her. I, I want to try to get either Tess or Belle. But then uh, we tried, we, we, I think at that time we managed to sedate uh, Tess. But Belle was trying to kind of push her to 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 keep moving. So she start to put her trunk on Belle, on Tess body and try kind of to pull her. But Tess was like a bit um sleepy already, half sleepy. So she's a very slow. Um and Belle doesn't want to leave her. 
she stayed there. At the end, we had we decided to kind of um, to make sure that we don't stress uh, both elephants, so we have to also sedate Belle. So they were like standing uh, next to each other, uh, you know, while we are doing the coloring. So um, that that was very interesting. Next one, please. Uh, and after that, you know, we see that uh, again. Uh, this animal, uh, these two females helping each other to look after the, the calf. Um, this is, uh, you can see this uh, situation when the elephants are really, really uh, comfortable, uh, you know, in the afternoon, if they don't feel um, any threat, so everyone will like lay down for, for a while. So this is uh, the moment that really, you know, as a researcher, you, you think that, um, yeah, it's very special. All right, next one, please. Um, so uh, I get also to count the elephants. Uh, so while the elephants were trying to cross the river, this is also the best time to count who is in which group. Um, in Kinabatangan, the, the, the biggest numbers that we count so far is 189 elephants moving together at the same time. But things have changed uh, in, in Kinabatangan right now. You can see that you, you can find uh, elephants group everywhere, like really separating in smaller group. Uh, before this, uh, when I started uh, working on them, they, uh, they move in, in like 100, you know, over less than 100 together, but you can still see the smaller kind of um, family group. Um, so, uh, yeah, so next one, please. So the elephants have to move from one because uh, if you remember the map that I showed you before, uh, all this uh, forest block, uh, sometimes, you know, they were separated. Uh, you, you, I mean, these elephants, they, it's really hard for them to move, so they have to cross the river. So if, it's, uh, if you can see that while one family group um, cross, swimming, uh, crossing the river, you can see the other family group uh, on the other side. So sometimes you can see, you know, like seven to six uh, family group together, and they will wait until everyone, uh, uh, you know, there, and then they start to, to cross the river. All right, next one, please. Our preparing area is the, the is the most important uh, area for the elephants. They like to eat to feed on the grasses uh, uh, in this area, and sometimes as well. Uh, this is where all the social interaction happen. So after, you know, the whole day separated and then they meet in this area, they will start to feed and they will start to exchange information. So repairing area along Kinabatangan River is very, very important uh, to keep, uh, uh, you know, to, to uh, for the elephants to um, uh, build the, their bonding, the family bonding. Next one, please. All right. So this is where uh, I think the one of the situation where these two uh, females try to learn each other what uh, you eat. So um, again, like I said, uh, grasses is is uh, you know um, what they need to what they like what they preferred, and um, repaired area is where. Uh, all this and uh, uh, this female elephants will pass on their knowledge and information to to their youngs and to the sub adults and this is how they learn from each other. Right, next one, please. Okay, so more or less, uh, if I can zoom back to the, um, you know, um on the Saba level, if you can see, this is the three populations that you can find in Saba. You have Lower Kinabatangan and Tabin and Central Saba. Central Saba has the the most, uh, the biggest uh, uh, population, about 100, 900 to 1,000 uh, elephants. And Lower Kinabatangan and also Tabin are isolated uh, from each other and also from the Central Forest. And you can see that even in the in their, you know, like many elephant ranges, you can see there are still a lot of um, development, a lot of um, habitat uh, 
uh, change there, land use change there. Next one, please. Um, so in 2000, from 2008, we started to collar these elephants because we want to understand, uh, you know, simple questions. What are the most crucial uh, area for these elephants? And then um, we want to know, because we want to kind of prioritize, um, especially for Kidabatang and our efforts to protect their uh, habitats for, for these elephants. Uh, and we doing this with uh, other organization like the Ground Field Center and also Hutan KOCP. Next one, please. Okay, so it's very simple. For Lower Kinabatangan, as you can see, uh, although on the paper, uh, it's quite big, you know, it's about 20,000 um, hectare, 27,000 hectare. Uh, but actually what we protected or what we protect for these elephants are not really suitable for them. So, you know, we protect uh, the area that, uh, we, that we cannot use for to plant uh, oil palm, for example. So we have swampy area, you know, we have um, limestone outcropping. And uh, when we look at the movement of elephants and as well, we ask the people who work with the elephants, you know, for more than eight years, um, we find out that these elephants can only use the area in the pink, um, pink kind of lines there. All right, so it's kind of half of what we protected uh, in this area. And then in even even though, even so, you know, you can see like uh, the one in, in the, the red lines, those are the bottlenecks. So basically it's really hard for the elephants to pass this area. Um, so they have 20 uh, bottlenecks that really hinder the movement of these elephants. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so, and then when we try to, you know, kind of um, do a hotspots analysis uh, for about 14 elephants, uh, we realized that actually it is correct uh, that these elephants, are, you know, all, all this pink color uh, area uh, where the elephants are really uh, spend their time the most. So we are wondering, and we can see that around Sukau area, those are very important for us to figure out what is happening over there. Uh, and then over the years as well, we start to see that the elephants are, you know, moving outside the protected mall. So they are spending more time in the oil palm plantations. So, uh, you know, obviously if you do this, then there will be a lot of conflicts. So we are wondering like what is happening on each um, side of, of the river and how we can kind of... Um, uh, after we identify the problem, then what we can do to really help to uh, make sure the elephant can can move uh, easy more easily in this area. Next one, please. Okay, so so I'm back to the question: Why the elephants are attracted to the oil palm? So uh, every 25 years, it's very, it's not very economic uh, and it's not economical actually to keep the oil palm trees. It's very high. It's so it's, it's harder to harvest and uh, the tree doesn't produce, uh, you know, um, uh, fruit, you know, at least not much anymore. So what they will do, they will just fell the elephants. The felling program will start to uh, uh, begin. Um, the, okay, next one, please. So the if you can see the excavator there, they will start to push the trees and chop the trees into uh you know smaller pieces. So this is where it's like a festival for the elephants. They when once they hear the sound of the of the excavator, everyone, especially the male, will start to come out and follow this he these uh heavy machines and you know, really starts to fit on, on it. Um, and then uh, even, you know, the, the excavator uh, worker that, you know, we, when we spoke to him, he said that this is not a big problem, you know, because they will, he even know the strategy now, because at the beginning, he will just, when he chopped the trees, he will just put them together and the elephant will come and start to dig inside with 
because uh, they want to find the shoot. So right now he knows that the elephant love it. So what he will do, he will put you know all the big chunk uh, on the top so the elephant won't make a mess. So there is a coexistence already over there. Okay, next one, please. But if they spend too much time, then there will be a lot of, you know, like conflicts. They will get injuries. In this case, in this picture, the I we, we, we cannot explain how this bone broken, actually. So I don't know. I mean, even the vets, they cannot really. I mean, some, some, some says that it get, um, uh, fell into something, but but we're not sure. So uh, unfortunately, the the wildlife department have to put these elephants uh to to sleep. I mean, like yeah. So so yeah, he died. Next one, please. And then it's not only uh the big males. Uh, I mean the the big uh, elephants, but the smaller one uh suffers the most because you know when people they don't know how to. Um, really, when they do elephants control, they don't know how to do it. They really, uh, you know, really put a lot of uh, pressure on this elephant. Sometimes baby got separated from the group. And uh, there were times where we found uh, baby elephants, like often elephants, a lot. Um, and then, you know, but, but for some, it's very unfortunate. Uh, the, the baby didn't, didn't survive. Next one, please. Um, and at the same time, it's not only the elephants. Sometimes, you know, it's also caused a lot of conflicts with people, uh, damages to the properties and vehicles and crops as well. Um, okay, next one, please. So I guess um, what people want to do, and I mean, it's quite effective, uh, the electric fence. Uh, so this is the, the kind of the primary mitigation methods that people always choose. Um, however, you know, without a uh, good plan, then uh, everyone will protect their own land. And then um, that's when uh, there will be layers of electric fences and it will kind of uh, stop elephants again, you know, now from moving to, to other area. So if you remember, this is also another factor why you see the hotspots uh, um, in, in the hotspots map uh, uh, just now that I show you. Uh, so next one, please. Uh, and we know that for for elephants, which is uh, you know an animal who is big, uh, intelligent, you know like really move nomad, really use like a big uh, large uh, home range, and also very highly social, uh, electric fans will not be able to stop them if they really want to go to to that area. Um, so. Uh, at the end, if there is no, not really coordination or communication between plantations, so actually the uh, electric fence will not be as effective. And also, uh, you know, that it's, it's really uh, very uh, costly as well to these plantations, but you will not uh, be able to solve or to mitigate or to minimize the conflicts. Next one, please. So this, that is actually Sandy, one of the resident. And elephants, they are adapt to the situation. Like in this case, they, like I say, one, once they, you know, really want to feed, they don't really care about what's happening surrounding them. They just focus. So for those who, who uh, we can push them, but they will react again to, to our control, our mitigation methods. So there is a need to understand uh, elephants' behavior and, and hopefully by doing this, we could mitigate uh, the, the, the conflicts better. Next one, please. So my question is that, uh, you know, with all these uh, challenges, so many stakeholders um, uh, involved, mm -hmm. you know, so is, is coexistence possible then for, for this landscape? Uh, you know, um, so there are a lot of definition for coexistence. Uh, we need to have like a same vision of all stakeholders, what we want to have uh, the future for elephants in Kinabatangan. Next one, please. So 
what we're trying to do, I guess, is to. Uh, so I started this this um, organization. Uh, I registered this organization in 2018 uh, because we really want to try. We cannot expect our our society in Sabah to, you know, want to um, live along with elephant without giving them, uh, you know, the the skills um, to 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 live with this elephant. So. Uh, I, I really want to help the society to understand and to 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 to, to be uh, able to take this responsibility. Next one, please. Um, so one of the things that we are trying, how we want to try to do this, we think that for Kinabatangan is really crucial to increase the home range or the ranging area for these elephants. So with uh, Hutan KOCP, uh, they, they have been trying uh, so many years and they have successfully to uh, buy lands as well as to get private companies to kind of um, uh, not sacrifice or not, not giving up the land, but you know, uh, they identify the lands that is not really productive and give it back as a corridor. So they managed to now connect, for example, one of the forest block to another forest block uh, from using, I mean, from this um, uh, buying lands and also try to work together with private. Uh, but this is actually a small piece of Kinabatangan, there are still a lot of area along Kinabatangan that we have to secure this land so that uh, hopefully by having more land, then the elephants will not uh, go uh, too much outside the this, this area and really help them to, to move uh, to easier from one forest block to another forest block. Next one, please. And we also try to not try to secure this uh, corridor only in the forest area, but also outside the forest. So basically in the oil palm plantation. So uh, if you remember, I told you that this time is when the, uh, all these companies try to replant. So this is the best time to rearrange uh, the plantation. So, uh, you know, with their commitments to different certification, they have to, um, you know, protect their repaired reserve, for example. And some of these companies, they are ready to also set aside, you know, like different area that elephants spend time or need. Uh, you know, from the movement data that we have, they are willing to set aside uh, this, this land. And as we said that they don't have to give up, they can still uh, plan all pump, but then, you know, they, they should have like a strict SOP or rules. Uh, if the elephants are there, what they should do just to avoid conflicts with people. Next one, please. And then we are trying also with the local communities, with the workers, because a lot of them, they love the elephant. It's just that because the elephants are big, so they thought that the elephant will come and attack me or, you know, will charge me all the time. So we're trying to, we're trying to build the understanding about elephants' behavior. So if you basically, if you cannot even differentiate between male elephants and female elephants, then how will you kind of uh, handle them, right? Uh, so uh, it's very, very important for people to understand this situation. Uh, and then we also, so we provide them with trainings. We provide them, you know, with a lot of guide, uh, videos to show them, okay, if these elephants are um, angry, for example, what will this elephant do? How, like physically? So we, especially when the elephants are in mass, so what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Uh, and then we do this with, with local communities and workers in the oil palm plantation. So hopefully by having this uh, knowledge and information, then they will be able to kind of uh, avoid as much as, uh, you know, incidents uh, with, with the elephants. Next one, please. All right, and then we realize that uh, somehow, you know, if you put electric fans or you have corridors, they will still be um, 
conflicts. Elephant works, especially the males, they will still go outside and maybe knock down trees and stuff like that. Uh, so we need to, I believe that we need to still give some uh, kind of some um, financial assistance if this still happen. So I'm working with, uh, you know, uh, some partners uh, to try to develop uh, an insurance scheme for for people, especially the small holders, independent small holders, uh, to with this insurance scheme, uh, with with the hope that hopefully by having this uh, financial assistance, then we could uh, increase their tolerance towards the elephants. Uh, so right now it's still uh, uh, we are kind of try to um, collect uh, all the information needed to understand the risk. And then, you know, like try to calculate the premium um, uh, and then, you know, try to implement that in this pilot study. So I will keep you posted with this um, project. Next one, please. All right. So good news is was it happened just yesterday. This picture was from yesterday. So the state, uh, the Sabah government have uh, Publish uh, uh, the the new uh, Burden Elephant State Action Plan uh, for ten years, twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty nine. So Kinabatangan District of Kinabatangan has taken one step to create this uh, committee to implement all the actions in this action plan. So it's very positive. Uh, we believe that by having the support from different agencies uh, at the you know district level. We will able we will be able to like uh, get more uh, people to uh, join you know try to bring all the stakeholders relevant stakeholders uh, together to uh, implement and start to take actions. All right, next one, please. All right, so I guess uh, we are. It's very crucial to do something. Now in Kinabatangan, um, you know, now especially during the pandemic, a lot of um, people lost their uh, income. Uh, so there is very, very minimal um, tourism activities. So we, we really have to, uh, you know, start changing the usual, uh, you know, business that we're doing right now to really protect uh, what we have. So I guess the conclusion is is this you know everyone must take a, must make a choice uh, to take this opportunity chance uh, and change the story. Um, so before I end, next one please. I would like to thank um, my team who is you know uh, always there to do uh, elephants control and really, uh, you know, plan uh, the best team, I, I think, to uh, implement all this. Um, we are small, but I guess uh, this small team um, will make a lot of changes uh, with the help of, um, you know, all our uh, supporters. Next one, please. Um, yeah, thank you to all these people who trust us, although we are still new. Uh, I'm. If there is any question, thank you, John, for this opportunity to share my work. Uh, I'm happy to answer any question, if there is any. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much, Farina. That is a, a great talk. Congratulations on getting the action plan published. I know I, I've been involved in a couple of action plans and I know how much work goes into them and then, yeah. then get, just to get them written and before getting it all the way through approvals and, and all those other things up through the government. So fantastic work. Well done. Um, congratulations. Yeah. Um, you must be, must be so relieved or at least happy and on to the next project knowing you. Sorry, but I'm so sad. Yeah, I'm so excited because this committee has been established now. So we are going to start implementing. So that is, yeah, it's very exciting. Oh, perfect. Um, I I have one question and then we'll ask for questions from the floor. Um, now, so I understand the, the, the elephants eat the oil palms, but they eat the old oil mm -hmm. palms only? The, they don't go for the baby, the baby, the shoots, the, the young oil, the young palms. 
Right. So uh, not really. They will do this if you. So what happened before this? We thought that they have love the the small like um. Usually the most vulnerable old farm is between three to five years old, right? Because it's very small and then the elephant will get to push. Uh, we realized that uh, before this, the practice was uh, when they chip, the, when they fell the trees, they will straight away plant this, this small trees, right? So this elephant will come and they will eat on the on the chip, uh, on the this uh, smaller uh, trees right but but at the same time they will push they will take the opportunity to push the small trees so the current uh, after sometimes you know we learn this and we realize that it's better for you to leave when you fell the trees you let it for two three months let the elephants come and eat and when you plant the elephant actually they don't really push the this, this small tree so basically they really want the shoots there is not much shoots in the smaller trees you know so I think they prefer the bigger one, then there will be more tree, uh, uh, more, more shoots in there. But sometimes they also push the, the adult trees because um, I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, mushroom called Ganoderma. So basically Ganoderma, they affect the, the roots of the tree. So it's really easy for the elephant to push. So sometimes the elephant will do this. And there are a lot of area as well where uh, the companies, they, they uh, plant until, you know, in the flooding in uh, flooding area. So, you know, area we are prone to flood. So that the trees will, will uh, grow like this, not, not straight, but it will go like this. So it's very easy for elephants as well to push it. So, so yeah, I, yeah. Do I answer your question? <laughs> Yes, perfectly. Thank yeah. you. So luckily, they prefer the, the old used non productive, non productive palm. But um, sometimes they yeah. will push, put they will push over the, the new the younger ones just for um just because they're elephants and elephants push trees over similar yeah. to uh, similar to um, uh, rubber plantations up in China. Mm. Um, Antoinette, did you have a question? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for now for this excellent presentation and for everything that you do and so proud of you. Thank and you. Yeah, I can still remember the moment that we were on the boat when you were in the middle of your PhD and yeah, you inspired me a lot. And um, yeah, so thank you for all your excellent work. And yeah, I was just wondering over all those years, like now there's so much evidence of like the, the low genetic diversity of, as a subspecies. And now with the new um, action plan, like do you feel that there's more priority now of like increasing connectivity and like are you hopeful that things are changing for the better for the body and elephants um i know there's like a very strong economic interest in the, in the palm oil plantations obviously but yeah we're right. just like very interested how you see the future and if you think that that corridor is really going to be connected and um yeah how you see the future of the body and elephant Right. So thanks, Anne, for the question. So basically, I think to connect from one MER to another MER, that is really a huge thing, which I'm not sure, I'm not very confident that, you know, we will be able to achieve that, although it's in the action plan. But what we're trying to focus right now is to really connect you know the small to make sure that kinabatangan is more integrated now that it's it's that we are we still have all this unprotected forest so we have to try to get that uh you know protected and then we still have to get all this riparian like try to expand that uh and at the same time you know try to get uh really identify all this area where the elephants really hard for them to move uh, and get this corridor and it's very possible we just need to get uh, some proof you know that the oil palm when they do this corridor they will still get to do their business so by doing conservation it will not stop you from making profit and we are you know like we, we want to show there is a project that we're going to do with Sirat um, that when you um, protect your 
uh, uh, riparian area, then actually you are improving the soil actually. So you will not use as much fertilizer because fertilizer is the biggest bark that all palm plantation have to spend their money. You know, so we want to try, we are trying to do this. So hopefully in the next two years, together with Hutan, Sirat and the plantation, Melanking oil palm plantation, we want to prove this. So hopefully then there will be more and more oil palm plantation that will feel more confident actually to do conservation. So it's not just for certification, but it's really will give you a lot of benefits, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. That's very good to know. Thank you for that. I was wondering with your GPS data, do you sometimes mm. see that elephants like wander off like really far away from the lower Kilabutangan area? Uh, like for example, here in South Africa, you have elephants like walking all the way to Mozambique either to find yeah. other elephants or for crop breeding. Do you right. um, observe that as well? Right, so our strategy at the beginning until I think um, maybe two years ago, we call it most of the time female elephants because we think that they are more sensitive to the habitat changes and they, they know better where are the most secure and the most productive area for them, right? Uh, and then uh, we are starting to call the male elephants. Uh, this one, we don't call it them, but we observe one elephant did go quite far away from Kinabatangan, but not really outside Kinabatangan. Uh, but he, he turned back. Uh, I guess um, if we call her like male, then maybe we get to see this. But I know for one elephant that we call it in Central Forest, he came even from, uh, if uh, you know, it's quite far from, from the Central Forest up to Kinabatangan, the North Kinabatangan a bit, and then he went back. So her, his name is Umas, and, and that one is really, and he always used all palm as if he knows his way. <laughs> And then he go back again. So that one, so yes, we do, um, we do, but for Kinabatangan, because we have a lot of, um, you know, females, then, then we don't really see that. But for males, I believe that they will do this. So we will try to call her. But the thing with male is that they know how to, to take off. They, they have, they always have this strategy. They know how to do it. You know, we have one time, we call it one M, uh, uh, male names, uh, guarding. He did this three times. So you, you imagine how much money we lost because of this. So that's when we decided, okay, let's, let's just do females right now. And we will start to do males because they are the one who live the longest in the oil palm. And we need to understand their strategy as well. Wow, I've never heard of um, elephants repeatedly removing the uh, removing the, the collars before. <laughs> I we even have elephant chew the belt as well because we uh, we we collar him and then he we we didn't uh, release him for, we, we we still keep him for two days and he have time to chew <laughs> and then he got uh, opened so elephants <laughs> intelligent. <laughs> Uh, they certainly are that. Okay, uh, yeah. Nisa, are you are you on? Uh, do you have any questions for us? Uh, yes, Kunjan. There is a question from Veronica Powers. Let's see. So let me read through. Hold on one second. So she asked whether are the elephant used to human presence or did you have to habituate them and were never concerned that you might get attacked? Uh, so basically, uh, I think for elephants in Kinabatangan, they are quite used to uh, uh, people's presence. So they know the area, for example, uh, uh, um, down river, where there are not too many people. So when they see people, they will be more anxious and they, they will start to react uh, more um kind of, um, they're not really that easy. But, you know, in the oil palm, for example, when you see them, they, they tend to know that this is, you expect to see people. So we don't habituate them. It's just that, I guess they, they know this is where you can find people. So, and they just want to eat. So, so we don't habituate any of the elephants. Um, 
I don't think that, uh, you know, a lot of people say, does uh, annoy you? I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> not yet. I hope, I wish one of these elephants still remember me. Um, uh, but no, we don't habituate them. I see. And also, so Veronica is, uh, uh, has been on our Facebook, very active on Facebook for some time, and we know that she um, is studying elephant communication, the huh. Asian one. Okay. And she asked whether does the Bornean elephants also produce specific type of sound? Mainly, there's a, there's a, a squeak sound that she's after. So do they make a lot of squeaking sounds? Uh, squeaking not really but we realized that the male elephant the especially the uh, the bull um, the bull elephants they will do uh, what do you call this a whistle you know that that when when you hear it I'm not sure if this come from their ears or from their mouth because we, we when we follow the elephants group we really try to hear this because one we know that we hear this and we, we all have to be super careful so i, I we um, the the burden elephants they don't produce a lot of uh sound um you know i remember before we collar them we have to really listen uh, and it's they are just behind so i can see that they do a lot of like follow when we follow them they do, you know, maybe I think they use their feet instead of vocalization. Mm -hmm. But for one, one, one special, uh, I think for burning elephant, they really do this whistle thing. Oh, yeah. so it's a whistle thing. Yeah. Interesting. That's interesting. I try, I, yeah, I try to kind mm -hmm. of uh, record as well, but I, I never get to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should try. <laughs> Veronica's on a special camera. Veronica's got a special <laughs> camera which tells you where the sound comes from. So you have to you have to get her across the Borneo to uh, to take to, to to video, and then she's I've seen some of the photographs or the videos she got from Nepal, and it tells you exactly where the sound is coming from on the elephant. It's quite fascinating. Oh, cool. So we'll get cool. we'll put you in touch with Veronica. Sorry, Nisa. Yes, go ahead. please. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, uh, Veronica also asked that does oh, let's see is it only just some families of elephant that come to raid? Or is it just the whole entire population do come to rate the palm oil after it was felt? Okay, so basically, uh, I don't think we have crop rating in mm -hmm. uh, Kinabatangan because the, the these elephants they all palm is something very stable. It's not like seasonal, mm -hmm. uh, and then. Uh, you know, because it's very, very small. So we don't think that they travel so far just to read. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this uh, replanting is happening kind of just since the four to five years. So really that they come when this tree is already being chopped, you know. So I don't, I mean, we, 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 we have to start uh, working on this to see crop reading behavior but our our males really they they stay in the oil palm not to crop rate because they they don't do that every night or and they, they just stay there they are the residents i think it's really limited of of land or space or something you know but they don't do that all the time it's always in the same plantation um and you don't really get a lot of report or saying that they do this every night or every week, you know. So, so yeah, I don't think that we have crop rate uh, groups in Kinabatangan. But again, no one studied this yet. So it's one of the important questions that we need to start looking at. Yeah, thank you for that. So it's yeah. kind of a, a unique symbiotic relationship almost, isn't it? That the elephants actually feed on the waste oh, well. product of the industry and don't damage yeah. the don't damage the the product the productive product. Um, that's, that's interesting. I think that's unique. I've not heard of it anywhere else in the world. Yeah, uh, but this is only you know like again I said that 
uh, yeah, because I there are a, a couple of uh, you know six or eight male elephants that always live in the oil palm. It's just from time to time, you know, they start to to you know push a couple of trees, and we start to guide. Okay, let's push him back to the forest and let let him relax or something like that. Yeah, so it's very funny. It's just that we need to start proving this. You know, try start to quantify it then people will believe us if we just say based on our observations so nobody will trust us <laughs> yeah. yeah okay anything more nisa oh uh, let's see uh nothing on facebook i uh, just wondering what is the do you keep track of how many elephant calf do you get per year? Do you know the percentage? Not really, not yet. So, um, yeah. yeah, because especially right now when they are, so we are actually uh, like really busy try to uh, figure out about all this connectivity, uh, but we can still see there are a good representation of each class, uh, each class. So, you know, you have, uh, you, you see a lot, a lot of people came to me and I heard this every year saying that, oh, we see more babies, we see more babies. Uh, and I always tell them that it's not the, uh, the right indicator to show that, you know, there are kind of increasing number of, of individuals. We just need like good representative. So this year for to, one of the um, action that we want to try to implement is to do a resurvey of the population. So hopefully uh, we will get to also understand the demographic as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nisa. And I just brought up for Nisa because I know you're a, being a vet, you're a, you're a student of such things. I think that possibly is the largest elephant poo I've ever seen as well. I'm just worried about how, how the elephant may have passed it. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty big one. <laughs> okay. So let me bring up a nicer photograph to, to end on. Um, that's nice. Wild elephants wandering through. Okay, well, thank you very much, Farina. I think that's all we have. Fantastic to uh, to learn about the elephants of, of Borneo and uh, and the work going on to pr protect them. Um, uh, we will put you in touch with Veronica, I think, because I'm sure she's fascinated to learn more. She's 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 doing a lot on elephant uh, elephant communication. And if something happens, well, I do my live stream every day with the, with the captive elephants here. And if something happens okay, that you cool. see, she she makes a note of it and tells asks me to 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 whether she can have a copy of it and things like that. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, very, okay. very, very interesting to talk to get you guys talking to one another. Okay, and that's about it. I think, ladies and gentlemen, I will be back for my live stream. I promise tomorrow morning, and I'll definitely tomorrow afternoon as well. Apologies again for missing it this afternoon, but other business other business came up and I had to leave. Um, oh, all that remains actually for me to say is to thank you, Farina. Thank you for. Uh, for joining and thank you for all the uh, for all the information do you have any 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 last words thanks uh yeah i mean if anyone wants to connect please follow our facebook uh Saratuatai. um anything uh you know any advice any tips uh i i more than appreciate because we are uh you know starting uh this this uh to do this so i look forward to meet with all of you and work together with anyone who interested to work with us <laughs> perfect thank you and uh, we'll be down as thank we'll you. be down as soon as we can travel not to not to help you but to or to help you maybe but but not to, not to teach you anything but to learn from you okay until until next <laughs> next wednesday we have yes next wednesday all right we have a an an elephant professional for you as right. well. And if not, we'll see you all on the live streams at 7.30 tomorrow morning. Until then, bye. Thank you, Anne. Bye. Bye, thanks. Well, thank you, Antoinette, as thanks, well. For your <laughs> no worries.